Good evening, everyone. It is my honor and pleasure to welcome our guest tonight, Professor Daniel Garber from this university, a good friend and colleague, also a doctor honoris causa of the University of Bucharest, a long time collaborator of our group, but who, who comes to Bucharest for many, many years, for 15 years it's now. Quite senior. And it's quite senior. But however, it's your first talk in the Chelsea Seminar, or the Seminar. We will have the house in that day, one hour talk, and then discussions, questions, and so on. And then I got the floor. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Mike. Uh, let me move this over. And, uh, Thank you very much, Donna, for uh, inviting me to uh, uh, to come here and to talk. Um, I really, in the last few years, it really has been at least twice a year that I've been in, uh, in, in Bucharest. And uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is um, the experimental philosophy and uh, the treatment of error in the um, experimental philosophy. Uh, in Bacon, and then later in um, later in the Royal Society, and I feel a little sheepish uh, telling this audience about Bacon because I think um, uh, the University of Bucharest is one of the um, great centers of Baconian scholarship. Uh, so Donna will know most of what it is that I'm going to say, but I think I, I need to give a little bit of background for. It. A few of you who may not be um, <coughs> yet initiated into the uh, brother or sister group. Uh, now, Bacon, of course, is one of the most interesting and complicated figures in early modern philosophy and history of science. Um, ironically enough, he's also one of the least well understood of the canonical figures of the early modern period. Um, though the famous method of the Novum Organum. Um, is well known and in philosophy of science actually uh, fairly widely studied, although I think very generally misunderstood. Uh, much of Bacon's thought has fallen out of fashion. In particular, it's only in recent years that modern scholars have looked seriously at his natural histories. And of course, uh, Donna and her group here at the University of Bucharest is uh, one of the important groups that's been doing exactly that. Um, and today I would like to focus on problems of error that um, the project of natural history um, raises. I say problems in the plural and not just problem, because as I'll argue there are a number of different problems of error that are at issue. Um, I'm going to begin with a brief account of Bacon's project and the way that error arises in it. And I apologize for those of you who already know this part of the story um, uh, pretty well. Um, after a discussion of his famous, but now often neglected, idols, I'll turn to the problems of error that plague the natural histories that form the foundation of his project of constructing a new natural philosophy, and the ways in which Bacon attempts to deal with those problems of error. Um, and I'll contrast Bacon's strategies for dealing with error to those of the early Royal Society of London, a scientific society founded on the model of Solomon's House in Bacon's New Atlantis. Well, I'm going to argue that Bacon <coughs> himself did not use this communal, communal mode of organizing the study of nature that he outlined in New Atlantis as a way of addressing the problems of error. Uh, later, Baconians did so when they actually founded the Royal Society. Um, I'll also argue that whether or not the founders explicitly <coughs> the structure of the Royal Society and its careful organization of investigation of nature effectively addresses problems of error that arise in Bacon's own natural history project. 
So let me begin by talking a bit about what a Bateman's project is. Uh, before addressing the problem of error, we have to say something about Bateman's larger project. Um, and my account here is drawn largely from the writings that Bateman published in 1620 and following, the philosophical writings by which he's best known in later years. Many, I mean, there are philosophical writings that are earlier, but um, largely with the exception of the, uh, the advancement of learning, um, um, they were unpublished. And so they didn't have influence until um, a bit later when, when they finally were published. Uh, the writings that I'm going to talk about include the great inspiration, the Instruction <coughs> Magna, uh, an, an overview of this project published in 1620 in a volume that contained his Note Morgana, as well as a work called the Parascheta, an account of how one should do natural histories, how one should write natural histories. Uh, this was followed in 1622 and 1623 by um, a book called The Historia Naturalis and Experimentalis, the natural and experimental history, which contained the history of the winds and the history of life, of life and death. <coughs> came out <coughs> two volumes, 1622, 1623. Um, there were other unfinished natural histories uh, that were only published after Bacon's death. Um, in 1623, he also published the, a book called <coughs> De Dignitate et, et Augmenti Scientiaro, right, on the dignity and on the increase um, of um, the sciences, which was a Latin translation an expansion of the advancement of learning, which had been published um, um, almost 20 years earlier. Uh, his last works were the Silva Savarum and the New Atlantis, both in English, uh, and both came out shortly after his death. Now, in the Great Inspiration, which is the work that was published in 1620, immediately preceding the, the, the New Atlantis, I'm sorry, the the new organon. Um, Bacon outlines an ambitious six-part program for philosophy. Uh, part one of the program is a survey of where we are in the project of figuring out the way the world is. And this is the project of originally probably the, the advancement of learning and the later Latin version of that. Uh, part two of the project is the method of interpreting nature the project of building a procedure that will help us to find the true underlying natures of things. Uh, and this project is the project of the new organon, which is what follows the great inspiration in this uh, 1620 volume. Um, this project is supposed to be both theoretical and practical. Theoretical insofar as it shows the true natures and underlying structures of the world, and practical insofar as it enables us to use the knowledge of nature, to control nature. These two projects in Bacon go together, of course. And he writes famously, human knowledge and human power meet in one, for where the cause is known, the effect, or where the cause is not known, the effect cannot be produced. Uh, but interpreting nature requires that we have some direct acquaintance with nature. In particular, Bacon thinks that the method requires, um, as a first step, that we collect natural histories and the, as the material on which the method is going to work. This is part three of Bacon's project. After we have the method and the natural histories, Bacon pauses in parts four and five of his um, six-part project to allow for some, um, uh, to provide some examples of the application of the method, this is part four, and to allow for some preliminary speculation about the ultimate natural philosophy, this is part five, before turning in part six to the actual construction of a, not a final natural philosophy from the method and the natural histories. In the construction of Bacon's elaborate system, error is an important consideration. 
It comes up, though, at two different levels. Bacon's consideration of error is most visible in his famous discussion of the idols in the book of the Novum Organum. And there he outlines four different idols. Obstacles for progress in the sciences, cognitive tendencies that lead us to error. And these are, these are sort of summarized um, on, on the first page of the issue of the handout. Um, the most basic is what he calls the idols of the tribe. And these are cognitive deficiencies that have their foundation in nature itself. I'm sorry, human nature itself. And in what he calls the tribe or race of men. Uh, and so, for example, uh, quote, the human understanding of its own nature uh, prone to suppose, is prone to suppose the existence of more order and regularity in the world that it finds. Also connected with the idols of the tribe is the fact that we're overly influenced by things that are attractive to the imagination and have a mistaken preference for things that strike the senses. And this is, this, this is something that is simply part of human psychology. We are simply all built in such a way that we are prone to making these kinds of errors. Um, so idols of the tribe are deficiencies that we all share. Um, but the idols of the cave are personal deficiencies that pertain to different individuals. They, quote, take their rise in the peculiar <coughs> constitution, mental or bodily, of <coughs> each individual, and also an education, habit, and accident. Examples of the idol of the, idols of the cave include people who are especially attached to their own theories or to the theories of particular other people, such as people who have, quote, an extreme admiration of antiquity or an extreme love and appetite for novelty. Included here is Aristotle, who, according to Bacon, quote, made his natural philosophy a mere bond servant to his logic, thereby rendering it contentious and well not useless. <coughs> uh, Bacon was no friend of Aristotle. Uh, but these are examples of, but he's using it here as an example of um, um, the um, 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 idols of the cave, those that pertain to particular individuals rather than to everybody in general. The third, the third um, kind of uh, idols are idols of the marketplace. These are errors that have crept in because we're too attached to language and words and are often misled by them. Quote, for men believe their reason governs words, but it is also true that words uh, react to the understanding, and this it is that has rendered philosophy and the sciences sophistical and inactive. Um, and as a consequence, the, quote, the high and formal discussions of learned men and oftentimes, oftentimes end in disputes about words and names. And he's obviously got the schoolmen in mind here, and the idea that in the end they they uh, um, coin words words like form and matter that don't really mean anything, but get stuck on them and wind up having long and useless debates um, about them. Um, and finally, they're the idols of the theater. These come from infatuations people have with particular philosophical systems. An example is that of the philosophy of William Gilbert, pioneer in the study of the lodestone, who on account of that wound up seeing magnets everywhere in nature. Uh, it's in a certain way very charming when you read his, his work and you see him attempting to, attempting to apply his theory of magnetism to explain a wide variety of phenomena. But I think that, that Bacon was right. This is a, a kind of, a kind of uh, um, um, unfortunate distortion of our reasoning. Making your own theory and then getting so attached to it that you see it um, everywhere in nature. Um, and all of these are ways in which we're led to error or beta. Um, through the innate weaknesses we share with every other human being, through our own personal deficiencies, through common language we use, and through the way in which we become infatuated by philosophical theories. 
Uh, needless to say, Bacon is very interested in eradicating the errors that arise from these idols. <coughs> these idols which arise from the outside can be, the idols that arrive from, arise from the outside can be, as he says, rooted out with difficulty. That's to say, the idols of the cave, the idols of the marketplace, the idols of the theater that come to us from the outside. Uh, but those idols which are innate, the idols of the uh, tribe, um, those are um, um, rooted, as he says, in the very nature of the intellect, which we know to be much more prone to error than the senses. Bacon thinks that they can be tamed in part uh, simply to the extent that we are made aware of them. It's important to quote, point them out and draw <coughs> attention and expose the mind's deceitful power. Um, um, but there is something else uh, more that we can do. He writes, quote, but better still it would be to establish and fix it fairly and for good that the intellect cannot make judgments save by induction. That is, induction in its legitimate form. And by the legitimate form of induction here, Bacon means the inductive method of his novum organum, of course. One wonders whether Bacon himself is captured a bit by an idol of the theater uh, in, this, in this case. But um, um, in this way, the discipline that Bacon's strict inductive method imposes on the intellect would help us to overcome idols which cripple the intellect. Bacon is not clear, entirely clear how his new inductive method is supposed to address the kinds of errors that arise from the idols. Presumably, an intellect suitably disciplined will be less susceptible to those errors. Uh, for example, if we must go through the process of constructing natural histories and drawing up tables of the sort that Bacon demands in his Novum Morgana, then we may be less likely to be led into error by individual and idiosyncrasies, idols of the cave, or by language, idols of the marketplace, um, or for many prejudices we might have for one or another system of philosophy, idols of the theory. Uh, but there are other problems with error as well. Bacon's method requires us to begin with natural histories. What he calls on one occasion, quote, the primary matter of philosophy and the basic stuff and raw material of true induction. Natural histories introduce other sources of error, not included among the errors connected with the idols. And that's what I'd like to turn to now. This is <coughs> one set of errors deals with the idols specifically. And these are psychological tendencies that we either all have, or at least individually some of us have. Uh, but the other kind of error derives from uh, the construction of natural histories and the way in which we do that. Okay, now first of all, there is a problem with the senses. Natural histories are intended to be collections of facts or better particulars. And one of the important sources of these facts will be the senses. Uh, Bacon is quite aware of the infirmities of the senses. He writes, quote, Now the sense fails us in two ways, for it either deserts or deceives us. The sense in which it deserts us is that because of, quote, the subtlety of the body as a whole, or the minuteness of its parts, uh, or its distance from us, we are not able to grasp through our senses um, um, either things that are very small or very distant. On the other hand, Bacon claims, quote, even when a sense does get a grip on something, its hold is not ter terribly secure. One might think that Bacon would remedy these problems through instruments. After all, he's writing in an age in which the telescope has brought the heavens near. We're talking, this, this was written in, the Novum Organum was, was published in 1620. Galileo's telescopic observations were published in 1610, 10 years ago. Uh, but it's also the, the age in which the microscope is beginning to open the realm of the invisible to, to investigators. But interestingly enough, this is not a strategy. He doesn't suggest that we, we build instruments to help make the senses better. 
His intention is to help the senses, quote, not so much with instruments as by experiments, for the subtlety of experiments is far greater than that of sense itself, even when it has precise instruments there. Now, it's not entirely clear what Bacon has in mind here. Bacon is quite clear that experiment by itself is not the solution to the problem. Elsewhere in the same text, he talks about, quote, experimental effort, blind, stupid, wandering, and prematurely broken off, which could hardly be expected to contribute to the reliability of the senses. If experiment is to contribute to the salvation of the senses, it must be of another sort. In another place, he says somewhat mysteriously that, quote, the sense judges only the experiment, whereas the experiment judges the thing. Presumably, the kind of experiments that Bacon has in mind in this context are the disciplined and orderly series of experiments, closely tied to his method, where he else, which he elsewhere calls experientia literata, or <coughs> experience. But again, it, isn't, it simply isn't entirely clear how it is that this is going to help us. Uh, whatever he, have, he, he may have in mind in this context, there's another problem related to the problem of error in natural histories. The senses are not only uh, not the only source for constructing natural histories. To understand what else goes into the natural histories, let me call attention to a passage <coughs> from the New Atlantis, uh, published posthumously in 1626, where Bacon described the function of some of the members of the House of, Sin of Solomon. The, 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 uh, scientific society that he imagined that he imagines in that work. Bacon writes about the lowest groups of investigators in Solomon's house, those who began begin the process of constructing natural histories that will eventually lead up to Bacon's promised natural philosophy. And this is on your, your handout on the first page. I'm not going to read through all of these. But the first ones gather experiments from foreign countries bringing books, abstracts, etc. Uh, then there are those who look in books in their own country to find, find experiments. Um, and other people who ask people in the mechanical arts what they know from experience, what they've learned from experience, um, and so on. What's interesting here, and worthy of special note, is the extent to which natural the natural histories that Bacon envisions, envisions here um, depend on texts and testimony, uh, in addition to the experiments done and observations made by the members of Solomon's house themselves. People in Solomon's house, um, and that, that, that um, the pioneers or miners do experiments themselves. But all of the other people in these, in these first categories are getting experiments by reading books talking to people, going out and seeing what people are doing in other countries. Um, and this is consistent with what we find in Bacon's last published work, uh, the Silla Savara, which appeared shortly after his death in 1626. In the Silva, a natural history in a hundred centuries, a hundred groups of a hundred experiments. Um, it includes a lot of uh, uh, what are represented as experiments and observations that Bacon himself seems to have been made. And there's every reason to believe that he did actually do experiments and make observations. But as generations of scholars have noted, it also includes numerous, numerous borrowings from other sources, from Pliny's Historia Naturalis, magic tricks from Della Porta's Monday Naturalis, traveler cha Traveler's Tales from George Sanders's uh, relations of a journey, and many, many other sources. Um, and with the borrowings from other sources comes the possibility of errors being introduced into the natural histories. Bacon, of course, informs his reader that he uses the greatest caution in constructing his natural um, 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 histories. In the Instauratio Magna, he writes, in the Great Inspiration, he writes, now the choice of narratives and experiments, I judge that I have been more cautious than people who have dealt with natural history so far. Uh, I, for I accept 
only what I have seen myself, or at least examined with the utmost severity. Uh, and examined doesn't mean that he's actually looked at it himself, but he's thought <coughs> very hard, I think, about the veracity of some of these accounts that he's getting from other people. Uh, we may think that what Bacon has in mind here is that we should only include the natural histories, uh, natural histories, things directly observed. Uh, but I think that's not his intention. His point is that whatever we include, whether it is personal observations or excerpts from books for the testimony of others, it should be examined with care. And the Parascheva, which is a little treatise on how it is that you construct a natural philosophy, a uh, natural history that follows the Novum Morganum, the New Organ. Um, um, he makes some uh, further comments about the dangers of false entries in natural histories. And um, that's that next quotation. We must also get rid of superstitious stories and old wives' tales, etc. I'm, I'm not going to read through that, um, but it's, it's <coughs> he, he is worried about um, um, having false things included in his natural histories. But in the end, he seems not so worried about the possibility of error in his natural histories. Any errors that creep in will be found out and corrected in the process of constructing a natural philosophy, he tells us. In the Parascheva, he wrote that, quote, the truth of axioms, that's to say the theoretical conclusions of the induction, will refute the falsehood of experiments unless the latter swarm everywhere. You know, as long as the errors are not overwhelming, uh, we'll figure them out. We'll figure out which of the, which of the observations and experiments in the natural histories are mistaken and be able to eliminate them in the process of building our natural philosophy. Uh, and in the Novum Organum, he uh, writes a Kregelin, and this I will read. Uh, and this is the next quotation, this is on page two. People will no doubt think, when they have read over this same history of ours in the tables of discovery, that there is something in those very experiments which is less than certain or downright wrong. And because of that, they may imagine that my discoveries rest on false and doubtful foundations and principles. But this is of no account, for such things necessarily occur when we are starting off. For it is like in writing or printing, where if one letter or another or other be misplaced or wrongly set, it does not generally get in the way of legibility very much. For such errors are easily put right by the context. In the same way, men should think that many experiments in the natural history may be unworthy of credence or reception, which will be easily expunged and rejected soon after by the causes and axioms we have discovered, as to say, by the final conclusions of our natural philosophy. <laughs> we'll be able to go back once we have built our natural philosophy and say, uh huh, that wasn't, that couldn't possibly have been a good observation because it's inconsistent with the natural uh, uh, philosophy that we built. And he uses this analogy of just as we were proofreading, um, a letter or two out of place doesn't really disturb the uh, legibility. We can go back and we can. Bacon was clearly aware of the fallibility of human cognitive faculties. His treatment of the idols suggests that knowing that we are prone to error helps, as does the method itself, an orderly, thorough, and systematic way of approaching the investigation of nature. In the constructing of natural histories, Bacon is aware of the dangers of errors creeping in. He seems to think that a bit of care is all that's really needed. Uh, the advance of theoretical natural philosophy will allow us to go back and correct any errors that may have crept into our natural histories. It's interesting to observe that all of the ways in which Bacon proposes to control error are open to the solitary investigator. 
though he proposes a scientific society in his new Atlantis, the House of Solomon. It plays no role at all in his account of error. Uh, this turns out to be a fundamental difference between Bacon and his later followers in the Royal Society. And now I would like to turn um, to them. Um, Bacon was later to have a monumental influence on the development of English science. Not only English science, but particularly English science. The House of Solomon, the central institution in Bensel, portrayed in the New Atlantis, was to become the model for the Royal Society of London, founded in 1660. An important doc document connected with the Royal Society was Thomas Pratt's History of the Royal Society, published in 1667. Now, there's a lot of debate about how reliable it is as a representation of how the Royal Society actually worked. Uh, but even so, and, and there's also a, a, a large amount of debate about the extent to which it represents the general view of how it is that it was supposed to work. It was, it was a work that was actually commissioned by certain members of the Royal Society, and it represents their point of view on what the Royal Society, well, it is taken to represent their point of view, even that's controversial. But um, um, even so, it's a very interesting picture of what at least a few people, I think, Strat, probably his sponsors, and a number of other people in the Royal Society, thought that the Royal Society was at that moment, or could be um, And as such, I think it's interesting to consider. Um, now, um, I will be, when I'm talking about the Royal Society, I will be talking about Spratt's version of the Royal Society. Now, Spratt wrote in great length about the importance of Bacon <coughs> in the Royal Society. Um, in talking about the inspirations for the new scientific organization, he writes, and this is, this is the first, the first uh, uh, quotation in the Royal Society, parentheses, Spratt, on page two. And of these, I shall only mention one great man who had the true imagination of the whole extent of his enterprise as it is now set on foot, and that is Lord Bacon, in, the, in whose books there are everywhere scattered the best arguments that can be produced for the defense of experimental philosophy, and the best directions that are needful to promote it, all which he has already adorned with so much art that if my desires could have prevailed with some excellent friends of mine who engaged me to write this work, as I said, this was um, a commission work. Uh, there should have been no other preface to the history of the Royal Society but some of his writings. Uh, even so, Spratt and his friends were not, um, were not altogether pleased with Bacon's natural histories. Um, Spratt writes, His rules were admirable, yet his history not so faithful as might have been wished in many places. He seems rather to take all that comes than to choose and to heap rather than to register. Um, one can see in this characterization um, at least the way in which many people have and continue to regard the uh, bacon of the civil um, There are those who see a deep underlying structure, but um, certainly at first glance, um, um, heat rather than register is not an unfair characterization, I think. Not altogether unfair characterization. Of, you have to look at what it is that's going on in that book. You have to look deeply to see structure. Um, and one can read much of the organization of the new royal society as described or proposed by Spratt, as a kind of attempt to address the deficiencies in Bacon's treatment of error. The Royal Society was quite self-consciously patterned on Solomon's House of the New um, which his literary executor, William Raleigh, characterized in his preface as, quote, a model for description of a college 
instituted for interpreting the interpreting of nature and the producing of great and marvelous works <coughs> for the benefit of man. But when the House of Solomon was built in London, it was put to uses that Bacon himself had not envisioned. It is the very organization of the Royal Society as a joint scientific enterprise that's going to address the problem of terror. And what I'm going to argue is that when Bacon put together the House of Solomon, it was because the enterprise of building a new science, starting with natural history, was just too overwhelming for one person to do. So he added, so he proposed a scientific society in which people would cooperate on the project and be able to do together what none of them could do individually, simply because of the magnitude of the project. But I think that when the Royal Society comes together um, um, in the 1660s, that the organization, at least this threat is conceiving, has uh, more complicated and more interesting and richer structure, one that actually addresses some of the deficiencies in Baconian philosophy. Now, um, the full name of the Royal Society was the Royal Society of London for the Advancement of Experimental Philosophy. Now, by experimental philosophy, they understood a group of philosophers who, quote, have proposed to themselves the right course of slow and short experimenting and have uh, prosecuted it um, as far as the shortness of their own lives with a multiplicity of their other affairs for the narrowness of their fortunes have given them each. So at greater length, Sprout wrote, and this is um, a second from the bottom on page two. Their purpose is in short, to make faithful records of all the works of nature or art which can come within their reach, so that the present age of posterity may be able to put a mark on the errors which have been strengthened by long description. Um, and I won't read any further than that. Um, um, the quotation there actually contrasts the um, speculative and dogmatic philosophers who want to establish sex around themselves um, 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 uh, for their own glory with these people, the experimental philosophers, who are just interested in finding the truth. Um, and so what they, what they did, what, what Spratt is proposing is really setting aside dogma, setting aside theories, for the moment at least, and just pursuing um, um, the, experimental, the experimental investigation of nature. Um, now, there's much to be said about the organization of the Royal Society as Spratt envisioned it. But for our purposes, the most interesting and most important details concern the organization of experimental activity in particular. Um, the process begins, much as it did with Bacon, with the gathering of possible things to investigate, drawn from all kinds of sources, from personal experience to testimony um, um, to books. And this is the next quotation at the bottom starts at the bottom of two and goes on to page three. Uh, this, prelim in this preliminary collection that has been the custom for any of the society to urge what came to their thoughts or memories concerning them, either from observations of others or from books or from their own experiences or even from common fame uh, itself. That's to say from what everybody knows. Um, and in performing this, they did not exercise any great rigor and distinguishing between truths and falsehoods, but amass altogether as they can the certain works of the opinions, the, the, the guesses, the inventions with their different degrees and accidents, the probabilities, the problems, the general conceptions, etc. And this is uh, what he is suggesting is very much like what it is that we do find in Bacon, which is which is you put everything together at the first stage you're not all that careful about, you, you want to you wanna get rid of the superstitions and what he calls the old wives' tales, but um, 
at the first stage, you're fairly liberal about what it is that you include. But after that, the procedure um, gets very, very interesting. Uh, whatever may have been um, um, learned from books is then put directly to test by members of the society. Uh, and unfortunately, um, yeah, this is unfortunately, I, I, I put this at the very end. This is the last quotation on, on the bottom of page four. I shall lay it down as their fundamental law that whenever they could possibly get to handle the subject, the experiment was still performed by some of the members themselves. That's important. Um, we may collect all of these experiments, but then we've got to do them. We've got to try to do them ourselves. And it's going to be the members of the Royal Society that are doing the experiments. Sometimes they let people choose their own subjects. Um, but sometimes they assign subjects by the society themselves. And this is the second quotation on page three. Sometimes the society um, uh, deputed whom it thought fit for the first prosecution of such or such experiments. And this they did either by allotting the same work to several men, separated from one another, or else by joining them into committees. In either case, um, the experiments were performed by multiple members, either working individually or working in committees. After the experiments are carried out, they must be thoroughly reviewed, though, by the society as a whole. And this is the next quotation. Uh, those to whom the conduct of the experiment is committed, being dismissed with these advantages, do as it were carry the eyes and imaginations of the whole company into the laboratory with them. And after they have performed the trial, they bring all the history of its process back um, uh, to the test. This part of their employment, they used to take an exact view of the repetition of the whole course of the experiment. Here they observed all the chances, all the regularities of the proceeding. What nature does willingly, what constraint, what with its own power, what by the sectors of art, what in a constant road, and what with some kind of sport and extravagance. That's to say, constantly or uh, only sometimes industriously marking all the various shapes into which it turns itself when it is per, uh, pursued and by how many secret passages it last obtains its end. Never giving it over till the whole company has been satisfied of the certainty and constancy or on the other side of the absolute impossibility of the effect. That's really important. Never giving it over till the whole company has been fully satisfied. Um, if the first great work of the assembly is to decide what experiments are to be formed, performed and who is who it is that's going to perform them, quote, the second great work of the assembly is to judge and resolve upon matter of fact. In the end, it is not, it is not, and that's a quotation from Sprat. Uh, it's to judge and resolve upon matter of fact. In the end, it is not the individual experimenter or the individual interpreter of nature who decides what the facts are, uh, what the experiments in question have established, but the Royal Society as a whole. Meeting together to fix the facts and thereby fix the way the world is taken to be. And in this way, the establishment of facts on the basis of experiments comes with the authority of the Royal Society as a whole. And this is the next quotation. And I dare, dare appeal to all sober men, whether seeing in all countries that are governed by laws, they respect no more than the consent of two or three witnesses in matters of life and estate. They will not think they are fairly dealt with at all. Uh, in what concerns their knowledge, if they have the concurrent testimonies 
of three score or a hundred. And that, of course, is the assembled body of the uh, fellows of the Royal Society. Spratt does not exactly say how this consensus is supposed to take place. But one can imagine the fellows gathering together in their meeting room in London and voting on whether this or that experiment establishes, establishes the existence of this or that fact. The experiment the reports are brought in, maybe the experiment is actually performed in front of them, and the group as a whole makes a decision about what the experiment establishes. In this way, the establishment of facts that go into natural histories in Spratt's Royal Society is thoroughly collaborative. From the selection of what experiments to perform to the groups who are selected to perform the experiments to the final evaluation of what the experiments show, the collective fellows of the Royal Society work together as a single body. Now, Spratt offers a number of ways in which such um, collaborative activity offers advantages over other ways of working. Some of the advantages are simply practical and have no great philosophical significance. For example, Spratt argues that experiments done by a group of investigators tend to get finished, unlike those that are done by single experimenters, at least some of whom are somewhat temperamental. Um, and this is the, you know, this is the next quotation which I won't uh, read. It is a custom of such earnest and powerful minds. And we all know some people who enter into a project with great enthusiasm. Um, and then just simply lose interest. But if there's a group of people, Spratt says, they'll get it done. Um, the problem is solved by bringing experimenters from different temperaments together into um, a collaboration. Um, and this is the next quotation. For, for this, the best provision must be to join many men together. Um, for it cannot be imagined that they should all be so violent and fighting. And so by this mingling of tempers, the impetuous men, etc. So you get people with different temperaments together. Uh, he obviously has never worked on a committee. But, <laughs> but it's a good idea in any case to get people from different, he thought it was a good idea to get people from different temperaments to work together in that way. They'll get over whatever impediments individual temperaments might uh, provide. But there are other advantages the, of the larger collaborations that spread conditions. Um, adv advantages that we may think of as epistemic. When you're alone in your chamber, you can convince yourself of many things that will not stand up to the scrutiny of public debate. So he writes, uh, and this is the next uh, quotation, <coughs> on the very bottom of page three. In assemblies, the wits of most men are sharper, their apprehensions readier, their thoughts fuller, than in your closets, um, etc. I won't read the rest of that quotation. Um, but having to present your ideas to other people means that you don't you don't sort of work yourself into believing something um, um, something unjustified. Um, but having to actually present them to other people, having other people criticize them and so on, uh, will correct some of the inclinations that you may have to go on um, track. Furthermore, having experience performed and evaluated by a variety of people cancels out the different effect, the effects that different people with different temperaments have on the process. Uh, next quotation on top of page four. It is not only true that those who have the best faculty of experimenting are commonly the most diverse from reading books, and so it is fit that the defects should be supplied by others' things. But also it would be it would too much tire and waste for at least the birthday spirits before they came to the main work. Whereas the task being shared amongst so great a number uh, will become not much more than the business of delight. Now, people often approach the world as advocates of different theoretical structures which distort the way in which they see things. A society that contains people who belong to different philosophical sects will avoid the problems that arise from each of these narrow sectarian viewpoints. 
And for this reason, Spratt emphasizes the diversity of the Royal Society. Quote, it is to be noted that they have freely admitted men of different religions, <coughs> countries, and professions of life. Now, Spratt seems to have had in mind by different religions, different varieties of Christianity. Uh, but even so, he claims that, quote, our church would be in so fair a probability of gaining very much by a frequent contention and encounter with other sects. Again, he's thinking about different sects of Christianity. Having members from different countries offers a number of advantages to the U.S. society. First of all, it would allow the society what they called intelligence, that is, information from other parts of the world. Um, but in addition, it would further increase the difference of temperaments among the, the membership. And this is a very charming quotation, the next one. Um, if I could fetch my materials whence I please to fashion the idea of a perfect philosopher, he should not, uh, he should not be all in one kind but have the different excellencies of different countries. First, he should have the industry, activity, and inquisitive humor of the Dutch, French, Scotch, and English, and laying groundwork a heap of experiments. Then he should have added the cold, circumspect, and wary disposition of the Italians and Spaniards in meditating upon them. It doesn't say where the Romanians belong in this. Uh, <laughs> um, all this is supposed to be found in one single man. Seldom in the same country bed. It must then be supplied, as we may say, by a public council, wherein the various dispositions of all these nations may be blended together. Um, and he also thinks that, that um, 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 having people of different professions in this society um, um, is pretty important. Um, and in the next quotation, uh, by the sequel balance, or in this, by the sequel balance of all professions, etc. He talks about uh, mechanics, physicians, um, scholars, and how important it is to have all of that mix. I'm going to finish in about three minutes, I promise. Um, to to being able to um, um, all to, to cancel out the biases that come with each individual. Um, uh, but in, in addition to emphasizing the diversity of the society, its particular advantages, um, uh, Spratt also emphasizes an aspect of its homogeneity. He writes, and this is the um, second to the last uh, quotation, uh, though the society entertains very many men of particular professions, yet the far greater number are gentlemen, free and unconfined. Um, and what he has in mind here is that as gentlemen are men of independent means, not engaged in any commerce of any kind, uh, but also <coughs> not engaged in university life, such gentlemen <coughs> don't have to worry about money. Uh, as a consequence, they can choose subjects of inquiry that have no obvious monetary or commercial value and can pursue them in an impartial and disinterested way. Um, and insofar as they are not connected with the university, they are not bound to the abstract and contemplative ideal of debate and disputation, as opposed to empirical research, or to the Aristotelian philosophy that still dominated the schools when Spratt was writing. In this way, I think the very organization of the Royal Society successfully addresses a number of problems with respect to error that they can face, but resolved in a very different way. First, there's the problem of the reliability of the census. The reliability of the census is addressed by multiplying the number of observers. If one observer is not reliable, then there can be multiple observers to correct the vision. The danger of accepting questionable entries in your natural history is also addressed by the structure of the society. Bacon is worried about superstition and false accounts, read in books and heard from travelers and unreliable witnesses making their way into the natural histories. His response, Bacon's response, is to hope that somehow they won't pollute the natural histories and that any false entries could be eliminated either from the initial care of not allowing them in or after we've derived our natural philosophy 
eliminating any elements of our natural history inconsistent with our final conclusion. Uh, the Royal Society has a very different strategy. We must observe things for ourselves. And this is their fundamental law. I shall lay it down as their fundamental law. That whenever they could possibly get to handle the subject, the experiment was still performed by some of the members themselves. Even if we start with books and testimony, they are not to be admitted. Uh, facts are not to be admitted into the natural history uh, without having gone through the rigorous process of being reproduced by the society and discussed by the assembled fellows. In this connection, we shouldn't forget the motto of the Royal Society, nullius in verba, on nobody's word. Uh, that's to say, see it for yourself. And finally, one can see the organization of the Royal Society as addressing Bacon's idols, at least in so far as they can be addressed. Perhaps we can never adequately address the idols of the tribe, the deficiencies in human nature. But the others can be addressed by the organization of the Royal Society. Uh, the idols of the marketplace relate to language and the way we are misled by depending too much on them. The Royal Society emphasis on experiment addresses them, forcing us to deal with things themselves, not things as they're represented in language. The idols of the cave are personal deficiencies that, quote, take their particular peculiar constitution and mentally, mentally or bodily to each individual, also an education, habit, and accident. These are addressed through the diversity of the membership in the Royal Society. If the Royal Society is made up of people with different educations, habits, and constitutions, they will collectively balance each other out. One might say something similar about the idols of the theaters. The diversity in the membership of the Royal Society that neutralizes the personal peculiarities that can lead, uh, uh, that can lead solitary investigators astray can make the imagination with particular philosophical systems less problematic, as long as different members of the society are attached to different philosophical systems. When Bacon proposed a scientific society in the New Atlantis, it was largely for the purpose of carrying out the six-part program, a program too vast and difficult for one person to carry out alone. But when it was realized some years after his death, it was able to do that, and much more. The collective mode of investigation pioneered in the Royal Society and other such scientific societies in 17th century Europe um, uh, was able to address the problems of error that had worried Bacon and others of his contemporaries in a novel, and I sus suspect, more efficacious way. And in this way, the idea of founding scientific societies may well have had interesting and important consequences that Bacon himself never anticipated. Thank you for your attention. Way 
place in which is uh, 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 in which to transmit this kind of knowledge, to, in which to transmit this kind of method. That is a communal aspect. That does lead into a communal aspect. It's different from from what you described, but which might be interesting. Does it? Does it? Well, uh, what text are you thinking about? I'm thinking of the aphorisms on the transmission of knowledge in the modern. Uh, in the non-modern, but also in, in the advancement uh, of learning slash learning. Well, I'm wondering though about those. Um, wouldn't they all, if, if it's what I'm, what, if I'm thinking of what you're thinking of, it, wouldn't they all work for an individual leader and an individual student? Yeah, there's a yeah, there's, you can work in the Teacher and the, uh, the there's a piece of community of two between the teacher and the student. Yeah, uh, that's true, but still, it's you know, I mean, it, the it coming is, together of minds and wits uh, that sharpen each other that goes for the beginning account of the transmission of knowledge as well. But there might be connection there at the pedagogical level. Uh, just, that, that it's an interesting, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting thought. I don't have to give it some thought. My inclination is to say that largely it is the transmission from one, from a teacher uh, to a student who can then go out and become either a teacher or an investigator uh, himself or herself. And, and uh, it's, still, it's still a little bit different from the, uh, there, there's, there is an element of at least a community of two. And you're right about the idea of sort of sharpening our wits. Yeah, that, um, it, it, this, this kind of thing does not have to do with that uh, but it does, ha it does have to do with the construction of, uh, of uh, practitioners of a certain type of knowledge pursue. Yeah. But the second, the second thing is a question. For, um, um, your take, your approach to, to these matters in this talk is uh, quite clearly a social historical uh, kind of approach. And uh, you've talked a lot about testimony and, and uh, the construction of matters in the past. And yes. also the community therein, which has been an, an important topic for the social history of science. Um, uh, from this point of view, another topic that has been interesting to this um, uh, 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 type of uh, historiography has been that of objectivity. And the question here is whether, from your construction here, do you think Bacon's solution to the problems of era and or the world society solutions to solution or solutions to the problem of era amount any of them amount to a um, what could be called an early morning variant of objectivity? Or is it another story? Um, but no, that's the yeah, yeah, no, um, um. It's obvious that there's a reference to uh, um, 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 to that to that discussion. Um, I'm not really um, entirely sure. I think that that um, what is later um, articulated as the problem of objectivity uh, in this period is articulated as the problem of error and bias. And I think that I think that you know that's what the idols are about. It is, you know, it's not he's not worried I don't think he's worried exactly about objectivity there. He's worried about the fact that we make mistakes. And some of the mistakes are due to our inner constitution. Some of the mistakes are due to um, external factors and how it is that we can take those into account, how it is that we can um, correct those. And um, he has various ideas for both of them. You can see also in, um, in Descartes, for example, in the, the um, uh, the opening of the discourse on the method. You know, I thought I was going to learn these wonderful things. And here I was, one of the smartest guys in one of the best places in Europe, and I discovered that it was all without foundation. 
just completely, just completely nonsense, right? And what is he attributed to? And you know the fact that that uh, uh, people's intellect, we all have this ability to discover the truth, but it is it is um, uh, twisted by our education, by youthful dependence on the senses. Later in the century, Malbrush will throw in the fall as well. I mean, it's that an Augustinian thing that goes way back. Um, and I think it's it's not so much the problem of objectivity as the problem of, of error. And I think, and I would put the the Royal Society guys in in these traditions, which is to say they're worried about the fact that um, um, something hasn't worked before. And what we're trying to do is build a society now that will, it's not like things have been going so great, we just want to figure out how to continue it. It's things have really not been going so well, and we need a new start, and we're going to figure out something that will address um, the kinds of biases that have crept in and the kinds of errors that people have made. And this is how it is that we're going to do it. Um, I think, or, or do you see objectivity coming in in another? Yeah, I'm um, just, just wondering if, if, um, um, if the, the, the project of uh, getting rid of individual biases, it was a project of reaching objectivity. Um, and later, I think later it will be it articulated. Will that. It will become that. Uh, but I'm not sure it's exactly that. I, 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 I still tend to think it's here a problem of eliminating error. Yeah, and I, I think not. that too. But, um, <laughs> just, uh, we are the best way of explaining this historically. It's not yet yeah. a problem. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I don't know. I haven't thought about it. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to throw in some salt on the same issue because I think that apart from uh, biases, there are many other ways in which Bacon deals with the problem of error, uh, even, even apart from the problem of the error of the senses. So error, uh, the yeah. senses being too dull and so on, and also uh, the human mind being biased are two sources yeah. of error. But then, but then there are other sources, like, and, and some of them, and some of the questions about the way in which in the experimenter can be a fault um, are, some, are connected with what I think might be a sort of theory how we approach truth by approximation. So it's, there are two ways of approaching truth. One is by eliminating biases and assuming that once you eliminate all the biases, you reach to something that is unbiased and true. But then in his uh, Kevin, Bacon gives um, a theory, but an information, in certain terms, of ways in which you measure things when you can, when you have enough data to measure them precisely, and when you don't have enough data, data you estimate them, and then you don't even have uh, properly estimating them, you just write down things about them. So there are three stages of precision. Which are connected with the fact that uh, these things that not very good recordings are better than no recordings, even if they are not not very faithful. So it's not only a question of having reliable testimony; it's also a question of having estimates closer or farther away from what would be an exact measure. So he has this sense of error, a sort of error versus exactness as well. And I think that that ties in very nicely with a kind of positive way of using uh, errors as being, how should I say, sort of um, an indication that you are closer or farther away from, from your, from your uh, recording. Closer and farther away from what? From a kind of faithful or exact recording. Not so much faith, but exact recording. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether the uh, sound of stress 
take this into consideration. The counter strike seems to be no, much don't. more a kind of a reading of your bias. Yeah, and then um, then, yeah that's okay. interesting. Once yeah. we eliminate all the biases and we agree with something, then we, are, like, we have reached it. It's interesting. I mean, this the, sort of this well, in in none of the um, sort of theoretical parts at least um, does he mention experiments that really deal with measurement. Now, Spratt is in two parts. There's a, the first half of it is theoretical. The second half of it is a um, um, sort of relating of various experiments that were actually done in the rest. And I must confess, I don't remember exactly uh, what it is that he talks about there, and whether or not that um, actually deals with uh, measurement. But he doesn't really measure, not mention measurement. And I know that this goes with your theme of, of arguing that thinking is not as possible for mathematics as um, one often uh, uh, thinks. And that his conception of, um, of, ex of experiment and experience does involve measurement in a very serious way. But um, what's interesting maybe is Spratt's conception of Baconian experiment is the the the, 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 the sort of the sort of um, um, naive conception of Baconian experiment that 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 has, has, has made it down to our times and, and isn't thinking about exactly those kinds of observations that would seem to be treated in a somewhat different way. But that's an interesting, that's an interesting thing. And the fact is, I mean, Spratt was not a scientist. Spratt was not a natural philosopher. He was not really an experimenter. He was a writer who had been hired uh, by a few members of the Royal Society. And the, 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 um, his, his bosses, I think, were, were um, uh, Boyle and uh, Oldenburg. And uh, he had been hired to write what was a publicity piece for the, uh, for the uh, Royal Society. So, again, how much it really represents what it is that was going on. Is, is, and how much he really understood of what it is that was going on is another, another question. But he was a good writer. It's good. It's good. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so there is a rather more obvious question. We all know that uh, Bacon uh, is the father of modern science. He was. Uh, scientific analyst, uh, to a certain extent an empiricist. Uh, he devised, uh, he laid the foundations of the inductive method, which is uh, uh, a method to uh, gather information and uh, reach, unlock certain secrets of the matter and reach new truth. Uh, by opposition to the usual method of the Renaissance uh, Aristotelian uh, philosopher, the deductive method. Uh, and he, uh, using the syllogisms, he reached certain truths, but only things that uh, were known before. In this way, I would like to ask you if uh, you can consider a certain uh, way of uh, relating or uh, uh, finding a connection between his theory, he propounded this theory of idols, uh, specifically in Renaissance times, to clear up uh, the minds of uh, <coughs> thinkers and philosophers. But uh, now, in view of the new discoveries of the, uh, let's say, <coughs> quantum theory age and uh, theory of relativity, can we relate the, is it still valid? I mean, is it still relevant, his uh, theory? I like his theory of ideas very much. Um. You know that by the quantum theory, uh, it depends on the observer and uh, it depends on the instruments he, uh, he uses. If you use a certain instrument, you observe something. If you do the same experiment and you do, don't use the, uh, the instrument, you observe something else. Uh, so uh, it depends on the observer, on the instrument. Uh, everything is relative. Um, Man's way of thinking, his idols. 
Um, I think, yeah, I guess this is, a, this is a very difficult question, and I am not at all an expert in, in contemporary quantum mechanics. But um, I do think that, um, um, they, well, first of all, but the, your first thing that Bacon was the father of modern philosophy. I'm sure that he thought of himself that way. <laughs> I think, I think that it's a bit of an exaggeration. Uh, there were serious empiricists and, and um, anti-Aristotelians before him, uh, you know, Renaissance people, that thought that they were doing empirical science as well. Uh, his inductive method actually didn't have much influence, I think, actually, but actually did have influence through uh, much of the period of the 17th and the 18th century was his natural histories. That's what people were reading and that's what people were imitating. And nobody much was actually imitating the um, conductive method that he used. But that aside, um, I think that the I think that the idols are um, um, very um, astute observations about the way people think and about the, the kind of infirmities in people's thought, and the distinction between the sort of innate biases that we have, that you know, simply our intellect is built in such a way that it leads us astray sometimes, um, and the distinction between that and things that come from individual temperament or from external learning um, is a very astute observation as well. Um, and. Um, I think that, that what you're talking about in quantum mechanics about the observer relativity, again, how to interpret that is, you know, an industry by itself in physics and philosophy of physics. And what exactly it means, whatever it means, it's not merely a human bias. It is presumably a feature of the world itself, which makes it particularly strange. It's not one of the idols. It's, it's part of the furniture of the actual world, independent of us. And um, I think you can say that his observations about the idols are still very, um, very relevant to um, um, contemporary thought and contemporary um, epistemological thought, whatever it is that may happen to um, uh, what we think is the right physical thing. But again, I'm not an expert in quantum mechanics, so I hesitate to say I mentioned briefly how Bacon could not take over or take up Galileo's, for example, experiments or, or kind of accept the telescope or microscope in his method, as far as we know. Um, and yet the Royal Society would. So uh, I'm just curious if you could say something more on this line. But between the Royal Society and the... Uh, and Bacon being some... I, well, we don't know if he's suspicious of instruments or he just doesn't take it over. Well, it is interesting. I mean, he does mention the telescope. And um, he's certainly aware um, of the telescope. It is sort of interesting that he doesn't. Um, Donna, maybe you know more about this than I do. Why he doesn't pick up the telescope? Well, why does why do he think he doesn't? Oh, you thought he you think he didn't? He mentioned Galileo's discoveries in 1611. Right, he mentions Galileo's discoveries, and he's aware of and and, and and there's every reason to believe that he read the Story Messenger. But did he ever actually pick up? Yeah. But did he ever actually take up the telescope himself? Mm -hmm. <coughs> There is there's, there 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 is a debate about whether or not Harriet actually you know and then who was another contemporary of Bacon's who was also interested in observational science um, he may well he may possibly have had a telescope uh, with which he made observations uh, but I I think you know one thing to remember at that moment um, it was not easy to get a telescope uh, and even if you did get a telescope. Uh, it was probably not as good as Galileo's telescope. And even if you had Galileo's telescope, um, uh, getting anything out of it 
was not going to be easy actually using it uh, to actually make observations. And this is something I think that Galileo worried a great deal about, is that, is that you know, even if you have the telescope, somebody would look through it, would not see what he saw because that other person was not as skilled in observing uh, as he was. You and then it, would, uh, it's more of a social explanation than perhaps an epistemological one. I think so, yeah. I, I suspect so. Because I don't think that, 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 that Bacon had any particular hostility at all no, to. Uh, we don't have, I don't think we have any reason to assume that he never looked through it, but I thought he didn't want to do it. What we know is that there is mentioning in the Halloween in a couple of places an actual clear of the heavens that he never did, or we don't right. know whether he did it, so we're clearly right. between that. And for that, the telescope would have been. The telescope would have been an obvious, um, would have been an obvious um, uh, tool. But of course, he never did adopt the Copernican uh, system, which is which is sort of interesting. He was he though he read Galileo, he was obviously not convinced um, uh, by the arguments. To he, he, he of course he died before, right? Exactly, he died before the dialogue concerning the two great world systems. But there are, I mean, the, 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 the uh, uh, sorry, messenger is a kind of argument for Copernicanism by arguing that uh, the distinction between the heavens, uh, that there is no distinction between the heavens and the earth. Yes. Yes. Uh, coming back to the idol. At least, at least, the, yeah, the idols of the tribe, yeah. And uh, the idols of the cave and uh, the idols of the theater by working in assembly, thinking in assemblies rather than uh, in our products, uh, right? Well, that's that's the Royal Society. What do we do? Solution. What do we do with the idols of the market? Um, well, I think um, there, there it's, it's actually, again, be in, in a certain way, becoming aware of them and becoming, becoming acquainted with things themselves rather than with, with uh, language about them. And what, he's, what he is um, um, worried about there is sort of scholastic debates that wind up being just about words and not about things. Um, and this is a theme, by the way, you have in Descartes, it's a theme that you have in Hobbes, it's a theme that you'll later have in Locke, and it's a common theme, I think, with the, uh, um, the anti-scholastics, that scholastic philosophy is just concerned with words. And if you're aware of that, and you actually handle things and do experiments with things, then you will you will not perhaps be be so um, um, taken with words. Um, But making sure that you're using them in, in a proper way. In a, in a proper way. Well, and make right, right and define words properly and so on. This is it's, it's sort of interesting. This is a theme that you get in that you get in uh, Hobbes, who was Bacon's sacred secretary. Is that um, is that um, to use words properly, you have to understand the thoughts with which they're connected. And you have to, and by understanding how it is that words are connected to thoughts, you can you can um, um, overcome um, the infirmities of a meaningless language. But yeah, no, I think something like that is not a bad idea. It's very sensible. Very sensible. It's a aspect of this too. It is, and we're going to be working closely together. We can. We can define our terms 
in such a way that we know what we're talking about when we talk about <coughs> bacon, uh, or bo the boy, for instance, or whatever. So, but problems arise when uh, correspondence or people who live in, in different camps use the same word, but probably mean different things. Well, there, there are going to be two problems with language. Uh, one, of them, one of them is going to be uh, when I, as a solitary investigator, uh, am using a word when I don't realize it's meaningless. Mm -hmm. right? Or I don't realize it's ambiguous. Mm -hmm. right? And so I get into trouble myself. But then there's also the, you know, and this is, after all, um, an idol of the marketplace. Right, so it does seem to involve implicitly um, an appeal to um, um, a community. I can also get into trouble when I use a word in one way and you use the same word in a somewhat different way. So we have a big argument about it and um, it turns out that what we're really, that what's really underneath the argument is the fact that we're really talking about different things. Locke uses Locke. that. Yeah, right, Locke. Right. Locke. So with, okay. with, uh, he uses the example of a liquid. So there's a big debate. Yeah, and... and is and it a liquid, is it not? And the term body talks about this. Yeah. But there is a, a wonderful example where he says there was a, a group of medical uh, people who were having a debate about whether or not something or another in the body is a liquid. <coughs> um, I think it's a liquid or a fluid, maybe. Yeah. And so Locke ends the debate by asking the different um, a participant, so what do you mean by a liquid? What do you mean by a liquid? So, and then discovering that there were really different meanings, so in the end, it was just, uh, it was just a verbal um, speech. And you're right, that's a kind of communal. That is a kind of communal. Um, yeah, Bacon does use, and the communal does come in, in some ways with Bacon, but in a different way, but in a different way, I think, with the words. For the, other, for the other way in which the words have power for us, which is that we are using words for things that don't exist, also the, the way out is by redefining words and agreeing that those things right. don't exist. So, so in a way, using the communal use of language and redefining words is, is for me clearly the way out from there. And also defining words in connection with uh, a theory that we all agree that we need to use yeah, but well, the thing is, I mean, that, that gets us, the second does get us around useless disputes between people. But the first is something that I can do alone in my chamber. I can think, okay, what is the meaning of body? What is the meaning of God? Does it have a meaning? And, you know, for example, I mean, um, Bacon doesn't, doesn't pursue this, but, but Hobbes will say, you have to ask, from what thoughts is it derived? And that, of course, is the, what Locke is going to elaborate at much greater length. And, and Locke and, 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 and Hobbes, for example, is going to say, well, it turns out there is no idea associated with the word God. There is no idea associated, there's no thought associated, he doesn't use the word idea, there's no thought associated with the word incorpor incorporeal substance. Right. And, uh, so, we have to eliminate that from our vocabulary. But, but that's something I can do in my own chamber. But in Bacon's case, can you do this on your own, just by pure thought? Because the Why not? thinking in itself is distorted by how do you realize that that can happen? In order to realize that you're Oh, because you've read Bacon and you're. And you're no, no, I mean, but Bacon's <laughs> no, 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 quite serious. By Bacon, so yeah, no, absolutely. You're being taught by Bacon. This is this is the the, the 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 that actually the idea that once we know that there are these biases, we can guard against them is again I think an extremely astute um, observation. Is that why they guard them? Bacon is not a limited number of biases that are associated with words. Yeah, lots and lots and lots. Yeah. yeah. So in a way, pure thought by itself doesn't help you. You have to appeal to that. That's that's where experience is coming in. And that's okay. So in a sense, so and then in, in this sense, uh, you cannot do it yourself in your own chamber. 
Well, okay. You don't. You can't do it by yourself in your own chamber. You can do it by yourself in your own laboratory. <laughs> Look, I'm not. I don't want to press this. I don't want to press this too far. But, but, but the fact is that uh, you know, community doesn't play. Community is there. I'll grant that. In in Bacon, but it it plays a, a really. The thing that I'm struck by in in reading Spratt is just what an interesting and complicated epistemic role community plays in a way in which it just is something that he just didn't see. And it's okay that he didn't see it. Uh, again, in regards with the idols, I'm curious, uh, in modern times, is, is there a modern theory in, I don't know, modern psychology or even evolutionary psychology in which these idols are uh, officially integrated or they speak about... I mean, is, is there a modern psychology that speaks about... Uh, yeah, idols? I actually think in, in a funny way there is. I think you can't go, you know, clause by clause and bacon and find something in contemporary mm -hmm. um, uh, psychology or epistemology or cognitive psychology. Uh, but I'm thinking of the I'm thinking of the theory of boundary rationality, uh, which I think is very very interesting. And the idea this is this, you know, this may be a little old fashioned for serious sort of cognitive science people now. But I'm thinking of sort of the Herbert Simon idea that that um, um, we are built in such a way the way in which our psychology evolved was to give us ways of um, reasoning that are extremely efficient, that we can do quickly, and that will, in most of the circumstances that we need to use them, give us good, reliable answers, but in a larger sense may lead us astray. So these are, these are um, I can't remember what word it is that they use. Um, um, for the, um, but but the thing is, these are these are these are routines that we have from an evolutionary sense, because for us to sit down, you know, imagine in every circumstance that you have to make a decision, you have to go through all of the reasoning that you need to do in a rigorous way. Uh, well, you'll get hit by a truck before you get out of the way. So nature has sort of built us in such a way that we have these sort of much more efficient routines. But on the other hand, they are heuristics, that's what they're called, heuristics, that, that work in a general sense, uh, but on the other hand, in a larger sense, are bias, you know, uh, give rise to biases. And again, I think that the right thing to, to say about those is, well, it's interesting that we have discovered that some of our sort of intuitive methods of determining uh, solving problems work only within limited context. But we should know that when we try to apply them outside of that context, we may go astray. Uh, and so uh, that is something, it seems to me, that is a kind of successor to the um, uh, Baconian idols. Oh, Bacon certainly didn't have any idea how about the evolutionary uh, part of it. And in fact, it's given, given the sort of theological background. Okay, I'm thinking Descartes and the idea that God is not a deceiver. Um, you know, it would be slightly embarrassing for Bacon to confront, I don't know how he would confront the argument that, well, you know, these, these, these um, um, idols of the tribe, we are built in such a way that we go astray. Really? Could God have, could a benevolent God could have built me in such a way that I have these innate, innate tendencies to, uh, these, innate, these innate tendencies to, to make mistakes. But that's what it seems to be that the idols of the tribe really are. And they can't be corrected so far as I can. Unless they're connected with the poor. It's not what he says. I mean, that's the sort of thing that Augustine would say. 
the sort of thing that Bob Rush would say. As a good artist, thinking of the best. Let's say Valerie tells me that we sort of had a good language and the bad language that we have now is connected with the forest. That's language, but is that the, the, the idols of the tribe? That's the idols of the tribe. <laughs> right. I think that the word in a way, and the idols of You really think so? Yeah. Yeah, the idols of the marketplace are things you can do about. Well, not, right. well, you can do something about it. You can really find words, but they still have power over you. Especially yeah, if you no, want yes, to, no. to give in. I think of the, no, I think of the, the idols of the, uh, 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 the idols of the tribe. Yeah. It's like, you know, having bad eyes. The only thing you can do, you can never, well, I guess these days with surgery, maybe you can, but you can never really correct your eyes, so you wear glasses. Right? You know you have bad eyes, so you do something like that that will enable you to um, correct it, but your eyes underneath is still always going to be distorting your That's the way I think of the idols of the tribe. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas with the other idols, there are things that you can do to actually correct them so that you reason correctly. In principle, I think you can that.